Hey, what's up guys? SpicyBan808 here with another reaction video. And today, we're gonna be reacting to our first educational or informational video. Uh, that's been long been requested by members of my Discord community. And the first video that was uh, requested was United States versus the world. Who would win in a military battle? And this is a army comparison video. So I'm very interested to see this. Uh, let me see one more time. Uh, this video is from the infographic show on YouTube. You guys can find a link to the original. Uh, or you can find a link to the channel in the description of this video. And you guys can go ahead and check out all their other stuff. All right, let's go. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Unmute tab. All right. Let's rewind that back. Let's go. Why is it muted again? Tech power on a global scale and there if needed in more than one region of the globe at a time. The United States, currently the world's sole superpower, fits this description with an official military doctrine that states its military forces must be ready and capable to fight two major theater wars simultaneously, a capability no other nation on Earth can even approach. But what would happen if the United States found itself in a war against the entire rest of the world? How would that war potentially play out? The rules of this war game will be as follows. No nuclear weapons allowed, and war will be simulated to have broken out after weeks of preamble, as in a surprise attack, the United States with its forces spread around the world would likely lose its non-homeland forces entirely, but not before delivering crippling blows to most of the world's major powers and knocking them out of the conflict early. The U okay, well, hold on. That was a lot already. Um, First of all, I was already, the first thoughts was, okay, nukes, everybody's just going to be shooting nukes, encountering nukes. Okay, so, uh, the person doing this video pretty much took weapons of mass destruction out. So, now, this is going to be super interesting, very interesting. It's going to be, a, even for the U.S., it's going to be hard, uh... Before before I play the video, uh, I used to be in the army. Uh, unfortunately, it was a very, very short stay. I was in the army for about 18, 19 months. Uh, I never got past basic training. I kept getting hurt. Um, I got hurt. I think uh, I got hurt in white phase of basic training. And then... Um, yeah, and then I, I ended up breaking my leg twice, and I had a fractured, um, my right hip had a hairline fracture on it. So I was in a cast for about a year, and uh, I ended up breaking my leg for the third time <laughs> after recovering and taking a PT test to go back to basic training. And I, I, I was already... Uh, at a recovery facility in Fort Jackson, South Carolina for almost for almost uh, what seemed like forever. Uh, it was uh, probably one of the best times of my life uh, because I met so many amazing people, um, a few of which I uh, I still stay in contact with uh, multiple times per month. Um, one of the best experiences of my life that I never really got to com complete. So it's, it is kind of like my biggest regret because, you know, uh, I do feel a little bit... I think a lot of the reason why I became a shut-in and an introvert was because I f personally feel like I'm not being able to... Like my body just kept breaking down and uh, it was unfortunate. It was like a big black... Um, a black eye for for me and uh, it took me over 10 years after going back home it took me went to when I was almost 30 years old I, I just turned 39 on Sunday February 19th and it took me until I was like 28 so when I went into 
the military to the moment I came home. Uh, I went into the military at 18. I came home right before my 20th birthday. That's a while to be away from home, okay? A guy like me from Hawaii going all the way to South Carolina for that long, culture shock, everything. And then, yeah, one of my favorite times, but it was also the time I most regret. Because if I could do it all over again, then I would definitely do it all over again. Anyway, I digress. Let's get back to the video. Um, so, if I had to make a quick comparison. Quick comparison. If I had to make a guess. I think the U.S. would have to... You can't take the rock from the boy. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh. Uh, so... If I had to guess before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video, number one, if the U.S. had to fight the entire world, control the oil, number one, I believe they have to control the oil because so many of the smaller countries and the two other, the two biggest powers that oppose the U.S., Russia and China also depend on oil more than we do. So... We take out or control the the oil fields in the Middle East. Bam. It's basically a battle of attrition. And everybody, all of the smaller countries with the smaller military, military power, they won't be able to self-sustain. They won't be able to fight a sustained war. You take the oil out, bam, you cripple half of the world, more than half of the world. And then it's only the big, the biggest countries that it's left. Number two, lock down the Atlantic Ocean, lock down the Pacific Ocean on both sides of North America, and not, and you create a blockade and you and you cut off the trade routes. So let's see what this guy says. Now remember, at the beginning of this video, he says. How would the United States fare against the rest of the world without nuclear weapons, without weapons of mass destru destruction? Let's go, let's check it out. US's main opposition would be in the form of a European coalition to include Russia and a China-India alliance. The rest of the world's contribution would be mostly in material supplies or financial backing, as while even nations like Japan boast a formidable military capability, they mostly lack the ability to actually deploy that power outside of their own borders. Yep. In fact, that would be the biggest hurdle to any global offensive against the United States. With historical military <laughs> preparations far, focused Alaska on conflicts detached. such as NATO versus Russia or China versus India, most militaries around the world lack the ability to transport military hardware across the oceans in a meaningful quantity, making a decisive assault against the U.S. homeland impossible. Meanwhile, due to its commitments to fighting wars well outside its own borders for the last 80 years, the United States operates the world's largest I love America, born to be an American, but I have to admit, I do not like my own government. I think the United States government is the dirtiest government in the world. Of course, freedom of speech. I have the right to say that about my own, my own government. Uh, but I, I love being an American. And uh, I have to say, one of the biggest issues that I have is our leadership isn't is up everybody's ass like seriously like do we have to be in everybody's business and 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 not only is blood be our brothers and sisters blood being spilled but all of the financial deficit that we have in our own country and we cannot take care of our own domestic issues is because of this bullshit right here. Like, seriously. I'm not, I'm not a political person. But I'm not as so as naive to not see that fighting everybody else's war, trying to police the entire world is the main reason why we have so much issues within our own country. 
and why we owe so much money or why we are in such a financial deficit. Let's continue. The largest air and naval transport fleets that number in the hundreds of ships and aircraft more than most modern nations combined. This lack of mobility will prove to be a major weakness for the global alliance and severely hinder their ability to respond to US actions. Today the United States operates its forces in every geographic area of the world and has split its command structure into nine combatant commands, Why? six responsible for global geographic areas to. of responsibility. In the weeks leading up to the outbreak of war, the United States this would is likely pull its forces out of Europe a lot and non-American bases in the, the Pacific, disbanding its European, right African, and Southern commands. Pacific Command, Northern Command, and Central Command would absorb these forces. Battlefield 1, Middle East. U.S. Central Command would receive an influx of former European assets, with the U.S. bolstering its forces in the Middle East in bases in Afghanistan and Iraq with one goal, destroying the major oil refineries and distribution. I said it in my prediction, I told you, <laughs> goal number one, control or get rid of the oil, wow. Distribution centers while denying access to the sea lanes that transport oil from the region. 81% of the world's oil reserves are located in OPEC countries, and over 60% of the world's oil passes through the Arabian Sea alone. The US's Jesus. strategic goals would be simple, shut off the global oil tap. With the world's 12th largest oil reserves, the United States could easily supply itself while denying the rest of the world access to vital Middle East oil. Europe, which... I did not know that. I... I did not know that. I know that there's a lot, like in many, many states, uh, there's a lot of uh, drills and refineries that, you know, that are pumping oil, but I'm curious though. I wonder if they if he's going to bring it up later on in the video. How long can we sustain ourselves? How long can we do that? Do we have that much oil under under our territory? It's crazy. Which would represent the United States' most formidable adversary relies on Middle East oil for 40 to 50% of its total annual use, meaning an American stranglehold on the region would cripple any European war effort as reserves run out and their economies begin to collapse. China would face a similar problem as 50% of its total oil imports all come from the Middle East making the region the first front in our war. At the outbreak of war, the United States would first strike at oil production and distribution facilities across the Middle East via carrier-based strike aircraft backed up by former European theater aircraft now based off American bases in Iraq and Afghanistan. With the world's largest air tanker fleet and flanking the all-important Persian Gulf from both Iraq and Afghanistan, American aircraft could penetrate deep into Middle East territory with impunity, striking at targets from the Straits of Hormuz all the way to the Suez Canal itself. Though regional forces would be able Man. to offer some initial resistance, most operate outdated Soviet-era or non-modern American if they put like a, aircraft, with the exception of current U.S. allies, such as Saudi of, uh, Arabia, subs and air who would be able to field modern variant F-15s, of those ocean Typhoon lanes? Eurofighters, they got it and locked. Italian British Tornado multi-role strike aircraft in small numbers. Without European support, however, the air war would go very poorly for Middle East powers for several reasons. Firstly, lacking a joint unified command, each nation would be unable to coordinate its air assets with its neighbors, resulting in confusion and low sortie rates. Most Middle East powers also field very few electronic warfare or early warning and control aircraft. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Israel would represent the most formidable threats to American air power, yet neither nation fields dedicated electronic attack aircraft while the U.S. is equipped with over 200, mostly F-35 variants and EA-18G growlers. Without adequate numbers of AWACS and electronic warfare assets, Middle East powers would be unable to coordinate the large amounts of sorties needed to counter U.S. air power, and they'd find their aircraft and ground-based air defenses actively jammed or spoofed by American EW assets. What I know is from my time uh, reading up on a whole bunch of... Uh, again, I was in the military from 2002 to 2004. I read a lot of books while recovering from um, a fractured hip and a broken leg. And I'm pretty sure <laughs> what I read um, in all the military books that I read from the, uh, whenever I had, I had a chance to read books is um, a lot of today's uh, airborne 
uh, flight um, capabilities are all stealth. Like the like he mentioned, the F thirty five is like a tweaked. It's a slower version of the F twenty two Raptor, and it carries a bigger payload, and it's not as maneuverable um, in a dogfight. I believe, but um, it still has that same stealth ability capability that the F twenty two Raptor does, and um, I think I watched like a national. I think it was Discovery or National Geographic. It was a show that said, whenever uh, if you got a good radar detection that the radius of the F-22 and the F-35 is the same size as a honeybee. The, the signature of those stealth jets are the same size as a honeybee. That is scary and impressive at the same time. Imagine going against an entire fleet of F-22s and, F and F-35s and you can't see it on radar. Oh, that is so scary. In the opening days of the Middle East War, the US would likely see moderate casualties among its air forces as it would be mostly operating against obsolete aircraft and disorganized or inexperienced air forces. The greatest threat to US craft would come from ground-based air defenses, which range in obsoletism yet remain a formidable obstacle to US air power. With a concentration of American power in the region, uh, it's a foregone conclusion that Middle East powers would have begun to move their air defenses to protect vital oil shipping routes and manufacturing slash distribution centers. Yet Desert Storm proved how effective the United States can be at dismantling a nation's air defense network, and most nations in the region have invested little into modernizing their defense infrastructures in the years since. The US would suffer most of its losses to its fourth generation aircraft such as its F-15, F-16, and F-18s, while its fifth generation F-35s and F-22s would prove much more difficult to contend with. With an inventory of 385 active F-35s, over 1,800 more on order, and 197 F-22s, wow. the U.S. retains the only operational fifth-generation air fleets, with current allies fielding a token force of F-35s purchased oh, from America, oh, and the man. Russians and Chinese still not fielding combat That's another reason why those aircraft. two countries Despite would be Despite its technological and operational superiority, however, sheer numbers would present a threat to American forces. So instead of seizing key oil production or distribution facilities, the U.S. would instead focus its efforts on keeping those facilities and trade route choke points shut down while defending against attacks on its air bases. A single sunk super tanker could block the Suez Canal for weeks, shutting down one of the most important oil trade routes in the world, while constant harassment by American air power would make the Straits of Hormuz impassable. With few major naval threats in the Pacific, huh. American Pacific naval forces would be split between containing China and bolstering U.S. Central Command forces in establishing a blockade of trade routes across the Pacific and Indian Oceans. With 20 carriers... That's what I said at the beginning before we started the video. But I did not expect... Uh, so the blockade ships on the right side of the screen, I predicted that's... That's the Pacific Rim. But I also said there would be a blockade on the Atlantic Rim, on the East Coast side of the United States. Uh, I did not know that they would uh, do this as well on the bottom. I Okay. 11 awesome. of which are supercarriers, more than the rest of the world combined, a blockade of the Indian and Pacific Oceans would be easily achieved. With a staggering 80% of global oil trade passing through the Indian and Pacific Oceans, the rest of the world would be forced to abandon any plans to attack the US homeland oh, and yeah, first they're try to dislodge give the Americans from the Middle East. Yet they would be doing so while operating on a ticking clock as domestic oil reserves begin running dry. In a prolonged conflict, immediate development of oil reserves in Russia would begin, though with only 80 billion barrels of proven reserves versus over 800 billion in the Middle East, it would be imperative for the global coalition to dislodge the US from the region or face eventual oil starvation and defeat. 
Europe would be faced with the difficult decision of committing the majority of its air and naval power to a Middle East campaign, yet with an American navy larger than the next eight navies in the world combined, they would be doing so <laughs> at the risk of leaving their coasts vulnerable to harassment from American attack submarines and carrier strike groups. American attack submarines in particular would prove to be an overwhelming force with 55 nuclear attack subs alone. Europe, to include Russia, fields nearly 100 submarines, yet only about a third of those are nuclear powered and range from 10 to 25 years behind US subs in tech. Ouch. Lacking in major transport Yikes. capabilities and the ability to adequately protect either their sea lanes That's like or any to attempts to move troops by sea, the global Corolla coalition would be extremely hard against pressed a Nissan to dislodge Skyline. the US from the Middle East. Yikes. While an eventual overwhelming of US ground forces would be possible, it would take weeks of buildup and slow moving of forces via ground routes to avoid American submarines. Victory in the Middle East would be possible for the global coalition, but would only come at great expense of dwindling oil reserves, and any attempts to reopen the Middle East trade routes would certainly fail, as the US would concentrate its nuclear attack subs and carrier battle groups in the region. The coalition would be forced to rely on existing land-based pipelines, though these would not be enough to sustain the world economy, and the United States would certainly commit its stealthy B-2 bombers to the destruction yep. of these pipelines and any attempts at building new ones. In short, a land victory would be probable for the global coalition, but without the ability to challenge the it US Navy, hard. global trade routes would be permanently so shut down, effectively hard. crippling the economies of coalition nations and the war effort. Battlefield 2, West Pacific. The West Pacific and South China Sea is the most economically important waterway in the world, with a full one-third of all global trade passing through the area, or about $5.3 trillion. China, South Korea, and Japan would especially have a vested interest in keeping these sea lanes open, yet none of those nations field a true blue water or deep ocean navy. In a global war, the United States would invest the majority of its expeditionary firepower in the West Pacific, having little to fear from an Atlantic incursion by European powers due to their lack of major military transport capability and navies designed uh, for decades so to engage Russian ships in no literal combat rather than blue water operations. Japan, okay. would, pose challenge for US forces, on the Japan would pose a significant challenge for US forces due to its very modern and robust self-defense forces, yet the island nation could be largely ignored due to Japan's lack of air tankers limiting the range of its strike aircraft and 70 years self-defense military doctrine, which saw the nation only recently begin to build an expeditionary capability. With 155 F-15s making up the bulk of Japan's air force and only what? a combat range of 790 miles, it is doubtful the island well, nation would sure risk they, its five would operational more, airborne refueling tankers fighter, to attempt offensive operations against wow. the US Navy and its over 1,000 fighter aircraft, instead holding its air forces in reserve in case of an American attack on the homeland. The US's first goal in the region would be to cut off all trade routes passing through the South China Sea. China would represent the US's biggest global adversary, that was my yet second like every prediction. other global power, to trade include routes. Russia, it too lacks the navy and the transport capability to actually threaten the US homeland. In order to deny the nation the opportunity to build this capability, the US would immediately move to cut off Chinese trade through the South China Sea, something China would be particularly vulnerable to as over 60% of its trade is delivered by sea. Though China lacks yep. a navy formidable enough to threaten US Pacific forces, it more than makes up for this shortcoming with its ballistic missile forces. Its DF-26 ballistic missiles each have a range of 3,000 to 4,000 kilometers and would threaten any US base or ship as far out as Guam. At the outbreak of war, China would immediately Damn. launch a withering missile strike against American facilities on Guam. While Guam would be defended by FAD, or Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Anti-Missile Systems, Aegis-equipped destroyers and Patriot missile batteries, China would rely on heavy saturation strikes and overwhelm American missile defense systems, decimating the majority of American ground targets on the small island and rendering it inoperative as a military forward staging area for weeks. This would force yeah, America but that's to just rely a on its naval victory, assets in the though. region, which would be the secondary targets of China's opening barrage. Though long touted as carrier killers, China's DF-26 and DF-21 ballistic missiles each rely on a very long and complex kill chain or chain of military assets required to recon a target, track it, and guide a missile to it. In order to accomplish this, China operates 30 Yaogan tracking and reconnaissance satellites grouped into constellations that Hold up. You guys think that that's why there's a whole bunch of spy balloons that we've been shooting down these past couple of weeks? I see what you're doing. Come on. It... 
Okay. Now, now I'm a little bit worried. I'm just a little bit worried now. If they can, if if China can sneak balloons into the U.S. and whether uh, the, whether they're transmitting data to um, find information on our defense structure, or if it's to extend the range of these guidance for their for their uh, ICBMs, then that is scary. That is very, very scary, and I'm glad that uh, they got they got dealt with. Um, now I feel a li just a little bit more vigilant, and I'm taking this a little bit more seriously because, just like many of you guys that I seen on social media and stuff like this, you guys were just laughing. Oh, it's not aliens. It's balloons. Oh my gosh, we took a, f a 17 billion dollar jet to shoot down a uh, a spy balloon, and I. But what if that spy balloon was like uh, one of those Wi-Fi or uh, Wi-Fi or modem router extenders that extends the range of your Wi-Fi signal? But it's for ICBMs. Oh, I wouldn't be laughing if that is a possibility. Let's go back into the, the video. Working together would provide China 16 opportunities per 24 hour period to accurately target a US Navy vessel to within 10 kilometers anywhere in the Pacific. The US would certainly seek to counter this capability with deployment of its anti-satellite weapon systems, of which it remains extremely secretive about. It is impossible <laughs> to infer just how effective US anti-sat weapons truly are due to a lack of information, but it is known that in the early 2000s, the US Air Force successfully tested a deployment of mini sats designed to kill or hijack enemy satellites and okay uh real quick from what i understand uh i believe the excuse or uh purpose of putting um weaponized satellites by the united states government was to uh air quotations protect us from uh you know comets meteorites or even asteroids uh that are in the path of 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 earth and you know um uh you know try to at least maybe mitigate or prevent a uh an extinction event on the planet but knowing our government you know maybe they maybe they got some warheads up there and you know, they can just uh, push a big red button and then uh, bye-bye everybody else. We don't know. We don't know. And in 2008, the U.S. successfully targeted and destroyed a defunct satellite with an SM-3 missile launched from the USS Lake Erie in the Pacific. With every U.S. destroyer and cruiser able to carry the SM-3, this could potentially pose a serious threat to Chinese space assets and degrade the capabilities of their ballistic missile forces. In a push into the Pacific, however, the U.S. would still suffer heavy casualties among its fleet due to Chinese long-range missile strikes. It's probable then that while can't, it works to destroy Chinese space them, assets from afar, sure. America would instead send its nuclear attack submarine fleet to blockade Chinese waters. China operates about 60 submarines Yet for years, those subs did not go on patrols or even leave port as they were often sidelined by maintenance issues. Only as recently as 2011, Aww. the Chinese subs actually begin to leave port, giving US subs the opportunity to tail them and discover that Chinese submarines were surprisingly easy to find and track due to their noisy nature. Defense experts estimated that Chinese Whoa. sub technology was 10 years behind Russia and about 20 years behind the US. <laughs> the US, meanwhile, no. operates 55 nuclear attack submarines, with most of these being of the modern Virginia class. Armed with torpedoes and a complement of Tomahawk cruise missiles, Virginia attack subs could easily threaten Chinese surface and subsurface vessels and join its Ohio class ballistic missile submarines in cruise missile attacks against Chinese inland industrial and military installations. While in recent years, China has invested heavily into improving its anti-submarine warfare capabilities, it is still critically behind even regional powers, such as South Korea and Japan, meaning that in the end, there is likely little China could do to stop US attack subs. Though it could likely keep American carrier battle groups out of the South China Sea for the first week or two of the war, 
China would be helpless to prevent a naval blockade by US attack subs. India, also Jeez. reliant on South Pacific trade routes, would certainly dispatch its naval forces to attempt to break a US blockade, but would face the same issues in challenging US subs that China would, having only 15 active submarines and also lacking in modern anti-submarine warfare capabilities, the Indian Navy would quickly find itself overpowered by American attack subs. Employing a combination of its submarine and anti-satellite assets, the US would likely break through the Chinese ballistic missile shield within 30 days and enact a complete blockade of the South Pacific, strangling regional powers economically. With a blockade of Middle East oil exports, the global war would then become a war of attrition, with the US starving out the world's major powers while able to sustain itself off its own domestic oil reserves. Having little to fear from a European transatlantic offensive due to Europe's lack of major military transport capabilities, American forces would be free to initiate ground offensives against Canada and Venezuela in order to seize its oil reserves as well. What? Ultimately, the, the US Navy, no. the largest and best Come equipped on. in the world, would be the deciding factor in a global war. With such overwhelming firepower superiority, the United States would be able to fight defensively alone. and without launching any major ground offensives outside of North America. Fielding a larger fleet than the next eight navies combined, the US Jesus. Navy, backed by the US Coast Guard, could easily defend the Atlantic sea lanes from any European incursion, while enacting blockades of major oil shipping routes through the Persian Gulf and Indian and Pacific Oceans. While the world would eventually be able to muster a large enough force to threaten the US, current military capabilities across the globe would be insufficient to prevent these naval blockades and would require years of buildup and expansion of navies from every modern nation. With the majority of global oil trade shut off by naval blockade, however, European and Asian economies would quickly shrink or outright collapse, making such a buildup improbable and ensuring an eventual US victory. Yet that victory would come at a titanic cost to even the US's own economy, oh, and in the course. end, the entire global economy would likely shrink to levels not seen since the end of the Second World War. So, how do you think this scenario would have played out? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called North Korea vs. the United States. Thanks for oh, watching, and as I'm always, gonna... don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next Oh, I am definitely going to check that out. So here's another thing, even if they did, even if they did, somehow the world came together and broke through and actually fought a war on U.S. soil. Not only do they have to deal with the ground forces of all the military bases that are all across the U.S. One thing you got to take into consideration Civilians. Civilians with the license to carry. You not only have to worry about soldiers and the military bases, you got to worry about regular people that carry concealed weapons and in their own homes. Just food for thought right there. Uh, Wow, what an amazing, this is this is my first uh, educational or informal informational video uh, that I've ever reacted to. And for some reason, my, my, I, I feel just so energized. I, I want to watch more of this. I'm probably going to go and look at more content from the Infographic Show YouTube channel. I will be putting to a link of this channel in the description of my video. Uh, with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm Spicy Ben 808. You guys can follow me on social media and join my Discord server, all in the links below. And uh, if you guys want to support my content, join me on Patreon for just one dollar. Uh, there are other tiers: three, five, ten, and twenty dollars. You guys can cancel and change tiers whenever you guys want. Until then, I'll see you guys on the next video. Peace out, guys.